Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear a chapter of Douglas Wilson's God Rest You Mary, read by Toby Sumter. Preface This small book is broken up into five lessons, or sections. The first deals with the foundational doctrines that are connected to the Christmas story. If Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, and he is, the Christmas story tells how the first preparations were made to lay that stone. The second section addresses a fact too commonly overlooked, which is the inherently political nature of the Christmas story, a fact that Herod understood better than we frequently do. The third lesson brings up some historical considerations. Is it possible to really celebrate Christmas in a robust fashion and yet honor our Puritan heritage? Didn't the Puritans have a Scrooge-like approach to Christmas? Well, yes and no. The fourth section concerns the much-lamented materialism of Christmas and addresses the problem by suggesting that the chin-pulling laments over consumerism are actually more of a threat to the true meaning of Christmas than all the plasma televisions are. And last, the final section is a series of daily meditations for the Advent season, accompanied with a prayer suitable for use as family readings during the Advent season. Lesson 1. To Gain His Everlasting Hall If the history of the world is a story, then theology is a type of literary criticism. We do not just read the story and go with the flow of it. We are also to reflect on it as we read. What is the meaning of the story? We do not just want to know that the infinite God was born as a baby at Bethlehem. We should also want to know what that staggering reality might mean. Of course, we must include the great events, creation, fall, the flood, the exiled Babylon, and when we include them, we must rank them. And if we do that, the birth of the Christ in Bethlehem is one of the greatest plot points ever. In this first section, we will give ourselves to reflections on what an odd thing the Incarnation was. How so? To gain his everlasting hall. Bethlehem was the opening gamut in the last campaign of a long war. Many centuries after our father Adam had first plunged our race into the insanity of sin, God finally made his opening move. Jesus Christ, born of a woman, born under law, was born to fulfill every one of the numerous promises that God had made during our long night. At the beginning of our world, scarcely had our race fallen into sin and darkness but our Father God swore that the seed of the woman would have vengeance upon the serpent, promising us a glorious deliverance. And so, for long ages, the faithful looked ahead to that undefined day, figuring, studying, mentally groping, but fundamentally trusting. What form would the dragon slayer take? What form would the serpent worm have in the day when his head was finally crushed? The servants of God, earthly and celestial both, were well aware of the great obstacles, but knew at the same time that the wisdom of God was far greater than any obstacle. But although they knew this, the campaign plans were still highly classified. The Apostle Peter describes it this way, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. 1 Peter 1, 10-12 It has always been like this. Our good God, our overflowing God, our God of yes and amen, has always been able to promise far more than we are able to believe. I am not here speaking of unbelief or of hard hearts, which is another problem. I am speaking here of a true and sincere faith, a God-given faith, but one which is still finite and which God loves to bury under an avalanche of promises. We serve and worship the God who overwhelms, who delights to overwhelm. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore, a cascading waterfall of infinite pleasures, with no top, no bottom, 
no back, no front, and no sides. Nothing but infinite pleasure in motion, and every one of those pleasures is attached to his promises. What does the Apostle Paul tell us about the salvation that this God would introduce into our history, into our story? Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 6-11 Because these promises stagger us, we have developed a workaround, something to keep us from feeling the crushing weight of God's promised goodness to our world. That workaround consists of pushing the fulfillment of His promises out past the day of resurrection, safely storing them all in a time when we are allowed not to think about it. But this passage from Paul is not talking about the eternal state. It has nothing to do with the eternal state. He lived in the third chapter. We live in the tenth chapter. And he was talking about the fifteenth chapter. He was not talking about the next book, the one we shall all read in the resurrection. These are promises concerning our future history. And so it is always thus. Our poets and seers see more than we do. They write poems and hymns. They write carols that are uninspired, but are prophetic utterances nonetheless. Just as Isaiah spoke far beyond what he could grasp, so also did Wesley. Just as the Jews memorized and chanted the words of Isaiah, words that were beyond their grasp, so also we have memorized carols that speak of the depth of glory that is coming, and we are always singing out of our depth. We are not singing about what will happen after the resurrection. We sing about the years to come, here, in our midst. We are singing about promises and blessings that will overtake our children's children. I do not say this by way of chiding or blame. As we have noted, the Apostle Paul said that it was designed this way. Eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love him? Then brace yourself, and sing to a world that needs to brace itself. We were in desperate straits. Christ came to ransom captive Israel, and to disperse the gloomy clouds of night. In our insolence, we were doomed by law to endless woe, and were necessarily and justly consigned to the dreadful gulf below. But this darkness we had created was invaded by the heavenly host. Rank on rank the host of heaven spreads its vanguard on the way, and the night above the shepherds lit up, as though a lightning bolt had refused to go out, had refused to stop shining. The road was weary, but now we may urge others to rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing. We needed this salvation just as he gave it. O Savior, King of glory, who dost our weakness know, the God who knows our frame, timed it perfectly. And so the ache was healed. In Bethlehem, in Israel, this blessed babe was born. This was Israel's strength and consolation. He was the dear desire of every nation. Now he shines, the long expected, and glories stream from heaven afar. All creation is summoned to rejoice. He is the high-born King of ages, word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Nothing whatever is excluded. We invite all that grows beneath the shining of the moon and burning sun to join in our praise. This gospel is proclaimed, and the antiphon is sung by the mountains in reply. All of it bursts forth. Both heaven and nature sing. This is right and fitting, because he comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. All cursed things may sing this blessing. The nations are gathered before him. On behalf of those nations, he is risen with healing in his wings. 
and so we summon all the nations to join us. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. Africa, come, we urge the Far East not to tarry. South America, behold your Lord, and we beseech our own nations to repent our apostasies and turn back to him again. This is not optional. The poets have commanded it. He makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. The saints of God are therefore insistent. Powers, dominions, bow before him, as we declare honor, glory, and dominion and eternal victory. We lean into the future expectantly, looking forward to the time when with the ever-circling years comes round the age of gold. With the dawn of redeeming grace, what is the only possible response? We gather to him and chant with high thanksgiving. And however high the thanksgiving is, the object of our praise is higher still. Come, peasant, king, to own him. We praise him, and he calls us, calls you one and calls you all, to gain his everlasting hall. And in the skies above that everlasting hall, the ascending hymns fill up the endless day. Indeed, nor eye hath seen, nor ear, hath yet attained to hear what there is ours. O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Amen and amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen again. Christmas Irony At Christmas time, we are privileged to reflect on how God in his wisdom has taken human sophistication and urbanity and folded it back over itself, turning everything around. The first Christmas was the time in history when God began announcing his mastery of irony, and it is also the time when the worldly wise began their fruitless attempts to studiously ignore what he was doing. And in this attempt, they shut themselves off from that laughter that William Tyndall described as coming from the low bottom of the heart. Christian literary scholar Anthony Esselin has identified three principal uses of irony, uses that God himself has displayed richly in the Incarnation, and which faithful Christians have been imitating ever since. They are the irony of time, the irony of power, and the irony of love. God is a masterful writer, and so the Christian faith is therefore the central source of deep, understated, rich, and lyrical irony. We love what words can do because we love what the Word has done. Our postmodern age likes to pretend it has mastered irony simply because our late-night comedians have mastered the cheap shots of cynicism, the ability to point, as the fellow said, to the price of everything and the value of nothing. But this is not the kind of thing we mean at all. Our use of irony, if it is to be Christian, must be a harmonious echo of what God has done in Christ. First, let's consider the irony of time. In John Buchan's novel, Mr. Standfast, the central character says that he would trust to Providence because, as a friend of his had put it, Providence was all right if you gave him a chance. Twists and turns in the plot are to be expected because there is a plot, one devised by a master. For the ancient pagans, history was not history at all, but simply a long, recurring, endless cycle or a meaningless clash of meaningless faded events. They assumed that atomistic fragmentation represented the whole fairly accurately. What you saw was what you got. But Christians, looking at the same phenomena, concluded something quite different. All these strange elements, seemingly headed in every which direction, meant of necessity that the last chapter of our world's story was going to be the ultimate denouement. If all things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to his purpose, then this means that billions of plot points are going to come together in the most satisfying, cathartic release possible at the end of all time. The great day of resurrection, the eschatological climax, will be what Tolkien called eucatastrophe and will be literary catharsis writ large, although large is far too small a word for it. Bethlehem is the moment in the story when significant numbers of readers start to have that aha moment. The consummate writer, God foreshadows what he was going to do. In fact, he was doing that from the earliest prophets on. But at Bethlehem, 
The central character arrives in the story, and those following the story recognize him. Those who recognize him this way are called believers, and as the story unfolds, there will be more and more of us. By the last chapter, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess him. But in this grand denouement, at the end, not only will everyone see who he is, but we will also all see who he has been all along. And we shall see that history, far from being a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, is actually the ultimate ironic tale. Christ, as the Word, is the irony of time. He is the irony of story. In worshiping Christ, in worshiping the Word, Christians are worshiping God's irony. Second, we should also reflect on the irony of power. How did God choose to enter the story he was writing? God overcame the world and its evil forces by setting aside his omnipotence and becoming a helpless baby. The incarnate one now had pitiful limbs, had tiny arms and legs, but even they were bound up tight in the swaddling clothes that Mary had remembered to bring with her. God was taking on what Martin Luther once called left-handed power, the authority that arises naturally from a certain kind of willed helplessness. We are not talking about the helplessness that is simply impotence fueled by cowardice. Rather, we are recognizing how to overcome evil with good, how a strong man turns the other cheek, how the one who could have called for legions of angels to rescue him from the cross declined to do so. The one who took the position of servant was given authority over all. The one who humbled himself to the point of death was given a name above every name. The one who spoke the galaxies into existence at the beginning of all things took on human flesh and consented to have his diapers changed. But he did not do this in order to demonstrate how low he could stoop, as though that stooping were arbitrary or aimless. Rather, he ordained that stooping this low would be the means by which he overcame the world, and he ordained that stooping in this way would be the means by which his disciples followed him into the kingdom. So Bethlehem is the place where every thoughtful person must wonder, what is he doing? And when we think we know, it is only because we have gotten used to the idea in that setting. But whenever we see someone imitating God's ways in this, at our place of employment perhaps, we are as startled as ever. And last, the irony of love. St. John tells us that God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. That giving began at Bethlehem, was continued in his perfect sinless life as the new Israel, and culminated at the cross where he died for our sins. He entered into his joy, and our justification, at his resurrection, and he now sits at the right hand of God the Father, where there is a torrent of pleasure forever. He is that cascading torrent of pleasure. He is that endless waterfall of joy, which is hard for us to visualize because there is no top and no bottom and no sides. But there is an endless motion of delight just the same. And because we are in Christ, we are right in the middle of it. So love sacrifices. But love never sacrifices at a dead end. There have been many sacrifices that look like a dead end, remember the ironies of time, but they are not at all what they appear to be. What could have been more of a dead end than to be flogged, crucified, speared, and laid in a grave for three days and nights? And yet, even there, God was demonstrating his love for us. He was not giving us one more tragedy in a long line of them so that we might be justified in our despair. Rather, he was conquering sin and death lust and the devil, and not giving us a lesson in pointless heroism. And so this is the meaning of Christmas, a meaning which lines up perfectly with the meaning of the rest of the story. God is an ironist. He folds the story up in unexpected ways, tying things together that we could never have imagined. He is the ironist of time, of history, of story. He, in possession of ultimate right-handed power, determined to set it all aside, and overcame evil by taking an invincible vulnerability, inviting us to learn how to do the same. He is not just strong, but also wise in the authority of humility, and he is love, 
which means he overflows in sacrificial ways. But his sacrifices are not throwaways, but always come back to him thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. Love is fruitful, and in imitation of him, we begin to learn that the more we give, the more we have. This Christmas, remember you are learning how to open God's gifts to us, and because he really knows how to shop for us, when we get the wrapping paper off, we are always surprised. Mystery of Incarnation Godly summaries of biblical teaching are inescapable, whatever we may call them. They may be creeds, catechisms, systematic theologies, or sermons, but when it is done properly, the result is consistently honoring to God. But of course, we need to take care to learn what done properly means from the pages of Scripture itself. Thus, passages in the Bible which summarize the message of the Bible are of great value to us. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 In discussing these things, there is no controversy about one aspect. The mystery of godliness is great. Note that what follows is described in two ways. First, it is a great mystery. Secondly, it is a great mystery concerning piety or godliness. But what follows are assertions that we would not typically relate to piety. This is because we have confused moralism with morality, pietism with piety, smarminess with godliness, and, at the end of the day, death with life. First, God was manifest in the flesh. Secondly, this Jesus was justified in the Spirit through his resurrection. Third, angels saw him. Fourth, he was preached to the Gentiles. Fifth, men in this dark world actually believed what was preached. Sixth, our Lord Jesus was received up into heavenly glory. What is the great mystery of godliness? What is the foundation of our salvation? God was manifest in the flesh. We sometimes do not appreciate the magnitude of the problem here. How could the eternal word of the eternal Father take on limits? How can infinitude and finitude marry? The doctrine of the Incarnation proclaims frankly and without embarrassment the most stupendous miracle that can be imagined. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. But we are dealing with mysteries and miracles, not contradictions. We are not maintaining that Jesus was God and was simultaneously not God in the same respect that he was God. We are saying that our Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, was and is one person, but a person with two natures, divine and human. These two natures do not run together in a confused way, but neither are they separated in such a way as to make Jesus the ultimate schizophrenic, two persons cobbled together. That which is predicated of the one nature can also be predicated of the person. Jesus is God. That which is predicated of the other nature can be predicated of the person. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. That which is predicated of the one nature should not be predicated of the other nature. Humanity is deity. This important barrier was established for us in the decision of the Council of Chalcedon. The next text also shows us the meaning of ultimate justification. We are told here that God, manifest in the flesh, was justified in the Spirit. We are told in Scripture that this justification was accomplished by the Holy Spirit in the resurrection of Christ from the dead, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Romans 1 4. This justification was of Christ vindicating and declaring who he was and is. But it was also for us, because all that Christ has and is, is imputed to us. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him, that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. 
Romans 4, 23-25. The power of the gospel is resident here in this. The power at work within us is the same power that God used in raising Jesus from the dead. Ephesians 1, 19, and 20. So, all things are ours. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, which was his justification, was also for our justification. In the declaration that Jesus was the Son of God, we are declared to be sons of God. This, incidentally, shows the glory of imputation. This is an insistence that we have not yet begun to dream about what has been imputed to us. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. 1 Corinthians 3, 21-23 Christ is seen, preached, and believed. When the angels saw the resurrected Christ, they did not see an abstract doctrine. They saw Him. When we preach this, we do not preach a mere doctrine. We preach Him. When sinners believe, they do not just believe a doctrine. They believe Him. What is the difference? Looked at from the side, all Christian preaching and teaching is made up of nouns, verbs, propositions, questions, and so on. In just the same way, the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper remain simply bread and wine. If a chemist were to scurry around the table when we are meeting with Christ there, he would find nothing but the regular stuff. And if a grammarian or logician were to break apart and analyze the stuff of preaching, he would find assertions and doctrines, nouns and verbs. He would see the form, but not the power. But saving faith, godly trust, does not stare at. Faith looks through, and so, children of God, behold your God. The last statement of our scriptural summary is that Jesus Christ was received up into glory. This glory of his is not limited to heaven. He pours it out. He bestows it. He imputes it to us. Everything that can be done with this glory is done, and it is done on our behalf. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18 How do we see the glory of the Lord with open face? Where do we meet Him? Where do we see Him? When do we converse with him? The gift of faith is what you are doing in the moment you hear the word. You are preparing for the sacrament. You are celebrating the fact that God was first manifested in the flesh, inside the flesh of another, his mother Mary. In this season of Advent, do you see your God? The Song of Mary The Bible teaches us a great deal about our Lord's mother and about her great and astonishing faith. But unfortunately, Roman Catholic errors, idolatries, and excesses have created or contributed to a great overreaction from Protestants, and hence a great loss for us. Often we do not even want to talk about Mary at all, still less with the great honor she deserves, for fear of being thought of as drifting toward the folly of assuming she is somehow co-redemptrix or co-mediatrix with her son. One of Rome's great sins is that of chasing evangelical Christians away from Mary. But the scripture remains clear in its testimony, at least. And in the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Luke 1, 26-56 Mary really was blessed among all women. It would be difficult for Luke to have communicated this theme any more clearly. When Gabriel appears, he says she is blessed among women. Verse 8. She has found favor with God. Verse 30. Elizabeth, inspired by the Holy Spirit, pronounces her blessed among women again. Verse 42. Elizabeth blesses her again. In verse 45. Mary herself recognizes that all future generations will call her blessed. Verse 48. If some have distorted this blessing by claiming too much for her, it is hardly fitting for us to distort the blessing through doing something else. Above all, what the word plainly teaches is to be our guide in such things. What was the character of Mary? Scripture does not tell us how old Mary was, 
but if she was typical of young, marriageable women of her time, she could have been around 14 years old. And in no way does the portrait painted by Luke represent her to us as a silly little thing. Quite the reverse. We learn she was a woman in need of a Savior. Mary knows of her need for forgiveness. She refers here to God as her Savior. Verse 47. The thought that she was personally sinless and immaculately conceived had never entered her head, nor should it enter ours. She was a woman of faith. Mary considers what Gabriel says and immediately submits herself to it. Verse 38. And Elizabeth blesses Mary as one who believed. Verse 45. In her song, she showed that she was dependent upon the promises of Scripture. The angelic messenger was no substitute for the word. God had helped Israel, and he had done so in accordance with the promises to the fathers. Verses 54 and 55. And at the center of her faith was the promise made to Abraham. Verse 55. Mary was quite evidently a woman of the word. This Magnificat is made up almost entirely of language from the Old Testament and shows a deep and thorough knowledge of Scripture. In particular, we are reminded of Hannah's song, 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. Not only does Mary's language echo the language of many passages from the Old Testament, but she also refers to God's saving acts recounted there, verses 50 through 52. She was a woman of deep humility. Mary knew that she was selected to be the mother of the Messiah from a low estate, verse 48. She does not interpret the blessing that was given to her in a prideful or arrogant way. And crowning all of it, she was a woman of gratitude. Her soul immediately turned to magnify the Lord. Verse 46. She rejoiced in her God and Savior. Verse 47. God had done great things for her, which she is careful to recount. Verse 49. Not only was Mary blessed, but so was her son. Verse 42. Mary overcame in the way women are called to conquer, by giving birth to conquerors, or by giving birth to daughters who will give birth to conquerors. And this explains how the Magnificat can have been composed by a woman and still be gloriously militant. Godly childbearing is militant. The seed of the woman has crushed the dragon's head. And so, at Christmas, how are we called to imitate Mary? as we treasure up in our hearts the wonderful revelations given to us in God's Word. First, we should focus on the Gospel. In one sense, of course, Jesus is the reason for the season. But in another fundamental sense, sin is the reason for the season. We have not entered into a season of feel-goodism, where we think about soft snow and candlelight with silver bells in the distance. Remember Rama, weeping for her children. Remember our abortion mills. Remember how dark this world is without Christ, and then cling in faith to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mary's only Savior is our only hope for salvation as well. Second, we need to connect this with strong views of incarnationalism. Not only has Jesus destroyed the overt works of the devil, he has also thrown down the devil's philosophy, which maintains that we are all to be very, very spiritual. But in the face of this false doctrine, God was made flesh. This means that we may build, sew, pick up a knife and fork, make love, spank our kids, shovel the walk, and do all to the glory of God. Earthiness is not the gospel, but the gospel did come to earth. Earthiness is no savior, but earthiness is saved. And last, we glory in victory. He came to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. God did not give his son to die in order to fight against the world with futility. The incarnation was no temporary arrangement. The baby born at Bethlehem was given as the Savior of the world. We all enjoy the anticipation of each new Christmas, and we all rejoice in the celebrations. But we don't ever want this celebration to drift off point. This is not the Armistice Day of a long-forgotten war. This war is ongoing, and we celebrate this decisive point in the war as a means of continuing the faithful battle. Falling and Rising And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, 
waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Luke 2, 25-35 After the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary brought Jesus up to the temple to do for him what the law required. Verse 27 There was a just and devout man there named Simeon, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 25 He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and it had been revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen this consolation, the Messiah himself. Verses 25 and 26. The Spirit brought him into the temple, and he came up to Joseph and Mary, took the baby in his arms, and blessed God. Verse 28. His first word considered what God had promised to him. Verses 29 through 32. Which is that he would see God's salvation, a light for the Gentiles, and the glory of Israel. Verse 32. Joseph and Mary were both amazed. Verse 33. And his second word was a word of blessing for Joseph and Mary. And he turned and said something to Mary in particular. Verse 34. Remember, this is all in the context of a blessing. The child is set for the fall and rise of many in Israel, a sign that will be spoken against. Verse 34. A sword will pierce through Mary's soul. Verse 35 and the thoughts of many will be revealed. Verse 35. The definition of history, which we will consider here, is all wrapped up in this blessing for Mary. There are four elements to this blessing, which we will consider in turn. 1. The fall and rise of many in Israel. 2. A sign that will be spoken against. 3. A soul-piercing grief for Mary. 4. The thoughts of many revealed. First, history as a story. It unfolds and develops, and this means that the characters involved are going somewhere. The last chapter will differ from the first. Because this is a long story, this happens in cycles. Because of what Scripture teaches us throughout, there are only two ways for this to go. They are fall and rise, or rise and fall. It is either death, resurrection, and glory, or it is glory pride, and death. And at each stage of this development, we have the setting for the alternative. If history were frozen, we could have static good guys and bad guys. But those who fall and rise might need to fall again. These things were written for us as an example on whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Don't be that guy. In the story, is a reminder that is constantly necessary. Pope Alexander VI should have been more interested in Caiaphas than he was. Yesterday's poor, now delivered, are tomorrow's wealthy, who therefore need to hear the warnings. Second, Jesus is to be a sign that is spoken against. Signs carry meaning, and when someone speaks against such a sign, they are saying, no, that's not what it means. But when God gives a sign, he gives it with a meaning that is plain. The culmination of this sign was the resurrection of Jesus, by which he was declared to be the Son of God. Romans 1, 4. This divine sonship means that Jesus will judge the world at the culmination of human history, Acts 17, 31, and that he is the prophet, priest, and king over all things now, Psalm 2, 8. Third, grief is real. We have every reason to believe that Mary is among the witnesses of the resurrection, Acts 1.14. 
but she knew long before this that the supernatural had invaded our world. George Herbert has a poem where he plays on the letters in the words Mary and Army, and says that this was fitting, for it was there that God pitched his tent. John 1, 14. Mary knew she was a pregnant virgin. Mary knew what Simeon told them here in our text. She knew what the angel had said, and more. So she knew that the cross was not the end of the story, but it was true grief in the story nonetheless. Knowing we are in a story does not prevent real story grip from happening. A sword went straight through Mary's soul, and she knew that it was coming years in advance. We have noted before that the weeping of Rachel for her children is part of the Christmas story. Nativity sets should have models of Herod's soldiers in them, and nativity sets ought not to have little drummer boys. This violence was part of the story. We should note also that Simeon included the violence that would be directed against Christ, and which Mary would feel in her soul, and he included this in the story from the very beginning. Earlier in the chapter, we read that Mary treasured up in her heart what the shepherds had said, and it says that she pondered them. Verse 19. Luke tells us at the beginning of his gospel that he gathered his account of these things from eyewitnesses. Chapter 1, verse 2. Clearly, one of his chief sources was Mary. From whom did he find out about Simeon? Again, when Luke was writing, Mary was the only eyewitness of that event, and she clearly remembered what Simeon had told her. She was preparing herself for the crucifixion, in some measure, from the infancy of Jesus on. But she also knew that this prophetic word came to her in the context of a blessing. Blessings have a story arc. Simeon said that there would be falling and rising. Blessings are not static. When Simeon told Mary about the pain that was coming, he had already said that the baby in his arms was the Lord's salvation. Verse 30. Mary knew from Simeon's mouth that Jesus was the Christ. Verse 26. Mary knew that this was a story that would not end in disaster. It would have a disaster in it, but not in the final chapter. The Gospels are not tragedies in any sense. They are not comedies either, if we take comedy as referring to something humorous. They are comedies in a much deeper and more profound sense than this. Christ was born to die, but he died so that he could be the firstborn from among the dead. Colossians 1.18 and lastly, Christ's coming will reveal what is in our hearts. We want to keep the thoughts of our hearts bottled up. As long as they are there, deep inside, we may pretend that we are the Lord of them. No one else knows our spites, our petty adulteries, our envyings. We keep them under our tongue like a sweet morsel. The doctrine of God's omniscience refutes this. But we have learned how to keep our doctrines up in the heavens. But Jesus. He has come down. He lived among us. His presence reveals, like nothing else can reveal, the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Not by projecting them onto a screen, but rather by showing the world whether we are drawn to him or repulsed by him. From the moment Simeon spoke those fateful words, the winnowing has been in effect. Come to Jesus, or go away. In him is light, and away from him, is only darkness. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was the opening sections of Douglas Wilson's God Rest You Mary. If you'd like to hear the rest of the book on audio, you can purchase it at audible.com or anywhere audiobooks are sold.